Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the combined meeting of the Pine Richland School Board. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. The board held an executive session prior to tonight's combined meeting to discuss pending litigation filed against the district by William Wickert and docketed with the Pennsylvania Office of Open Records at docket number AP 2021-1330, which litigation involves a request for access to confidential school district information. The board also held an information and strategy session regarding the negotiation of a memorandum of understanding to a collective bargaining agreement with the Pine Richland Education Association related to virtual instruction and continuity of learning for COVID-related absences. Roll call, Ms. Williams. Mr. Lyons. Here. Mrs. Misbach. Here. Mr. Kashani. Here. Mr. DiTullio. Here. Mrs. Aiden. Here. Dr. Mihalik. Here. Dr. Meyer. Here. Mr. Moy, Mrs. Swope, here. Thank you. Thank you. Recognition of visitors, uh, we'll do virtual first if we have any, Ms. Williams. Let's double check again here. We do not. We do have one in person, Mr. John Corey. Hi, I'm John Corey. I live at 306 North Wind Court. Back in February, I was together with a group of PR families trying to get my kid back in school. Um, from that meeting, we formed PR, PR Kids First. Um, a couple months later, Coach K was fired, and at that point, I was trying to figure out um, what legal options we had, and I hired K.O. Gates at that point, personally. From that came four separate FOIAs requesting this information from this district. Um, what you just referenced, Peter, in your executive session with Bill Wickert um, is one of the things that has just come to fruition. We had to take the first FOIA to appeals court. Um, the appeals court came back and said that PR owes that appeal two-thirds of the information that was requested. Um, we have another appeal that's due back on the 20th of this month. So everybody understands this process and what it, what it goes into it. The district gives you information, but never what they're supposed to give you. The process that you have to go through at that point is take them to appeals court. It's expensive. It's challenging. It's stuff that I could not write myself. It has to be written by an attorney. It's very hard. I'm very curious to find out if the district is going to appeal that, the last ruling. I also, the most recent one that I filed was over attorney's fees for this year. It's a pretty simple question. It's not that hard. The district did not give me that, made me file a FOIA for it. Now they gave it to me within a week, but I still had to file a FOIA for it. So everybody understands this district has spent $383,000 last year in attorney's fees. Part of that is fighting to not give us information, give the public information that it's due. And I say that with great confidence now because the appeals court has ruled that that appeal is owed two-thirds of the information that's there. Guys, look, you stood up there and congratulated yourself on being completely open. And that is the last thing that this district is being with the people that you serve. I will continue to file FOIAs and I will continue to send them to appeals court. And if you appeal this last verdict, I will come back and make sure everybody understands what you did and the money that you spend, our money you are spending to deny information. So you can choose your path, but I promise you, I'm committed to this, to the end, this end game. And we will have information and we will share it with everyone. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Corey. Uh, the right to know request, yours specifically and others are on our agenda tonight. And we will address that and correct some, I think, factual errors in your statement there. So that's at the end of the agenda this evening.
at the start of tonight's meeting, uh, we want to take a moment to recognize and take a moment of silence for the anniversary of September 11th. Uh, so if you could please join us in a moment of silence at this time. Thank you. Correspondence, Ms. Williams. The following people emailed the board regarding the health and safety plan or masks. Mel uh, Melissa Nicely, Joni Guzzi, Allison Duncan, Kimberly Watton, and Lisa DeTulio. The following people emailed the board regarding quarantine virtual learning options. Lisa Massiantonio, Diane White, Ashley DeCellis, Alicia Anderson, Jamie Gornick. The following people emailed the board. Kimberly Hagmeyer regarding COVID testing in classrooms and quarantine. Melissa Nicely regarding masks and locker rooms. Susan Pelletier regarding leadership. Ryan Young regarding leadership. Judy Masucci regarding vaccination status and quarantine. Heather Lozero regarding district-wide parent nights. Thomas Gaynor and John Green regarding transportation. Kelly Hayes regarding the school calendar. Greg and Leah Leah Hopkins regarding bus seating. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Ms. Hawthorne. Thank you. Pine Richland High School is recognizing graduate Jim Wondrang for being named a 2021 International Advanced Placement Scholar from the class of 2021. The distinction is awarded to students who display exceptional achievement across a variety of disciplines. Students must score a three or higher on five or more of the AP exams. In addition, 183 students at Pine Richland earned recognition in the AP Scholar Program with various distinctions, including AP Scholar, AP Scholar with Distinction, AP Scholar with Honor. Jin Wan is the first Pine Richland student to earn international distinction. The 2021-2022 Pine Richland High School dance team participated in the Universal Dance Association Home Technique Team Camp and received several awards, including qualifying for the UDA national competition. The team was unable to attend a camp at the UDA camp at Towson University due to COVID-19 cancellation. At the camp hosted at Pine Richland High School, the girls learned innovative choreography, attended daily technique classes, and participated in team building activities you can see the whole list of awards at PineRichland.org. Also, the community is invited to the Pine Richland School District Athletic Hall of Fame induction events. Inductees will be recognized at the Pine Richland High School Stadium at 645 on Friday, October 1st, prior to the Pine Richland Penn Hills game. The induction banquet for the class of 2021 and 2020 honorees is being scheduled for Saturday, October 2nd. And our inductees for the class of 2021 include Art Bassetti for football, wrestling, basketball, track and field, John Harold for football and track and field, Caitlin McGloy for swimming, Jay Novak for cross country and track and field, Michael Van Sickle for golf, and the 1970 football team, which was the second undefeated football team in history. In addition, the district uh, will be recognizing 2020 inductees that were also honored at a game last year. The community is also invited to homecoming festivities on September 17th. The Pine Richland Rams will take on Upper St. Clair. Community members will be able to visit booths filled with food, drink, and spirit apparel being hosted by various sports teams and organizations starting at 6 until the end of the game. The community is also encouraged to bring non-perishable food items to do donate to the Greater Pittsburgh Community Food Drive on their way into the game. You can see a list of needed items by visiting pinerichland.org slash homecoming, including more information about the event. So thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Item 1.05 is a motion to approve the meeting minutes as attached for the August 16th regular meeting. Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? Yes. Yes. Motion carries. Strategic plan update. Dr. Justice. Thank you. That's a, um, this is information. The 
bring everybody um, back to school in style and we've done just that we believe the kids are back smiling the energy is in the buildings you can feel them connecting socially um, we are really excited about the way in which we got the kids back and we plan to keep them here with their mitigation efforts in place so um, as you know that was the number one goal and we just wanted to highlight a few um, of the activities around the buildings in a quick way uh, we spent a lot more time on this within the committee meeting but um, it is exciting to see all of our kids here allowing them to sit three feet um, with uh, within three feet of each other is um, beneficial from a social aspect and so we're very excited that the kids are able to connect that way it feels as normal and typical as it has in about a year so um, we are very excited for that um, we have the kids outside taking mask breaks um, during phys ed they're able to get outdoors they are unmastering recess they are um, enjoying playing and being kids and um, really coming together in school and understanding the learning that's happening in the classroom but having that opportunity to connect um, so within Hans, we had um, some students utilizing Freckle, which is one of our math programs. They're doing that every day on our Chromebooks now uh, that we are one-to-one. -one. At Richland, uh, just a glance quickly into the kindergarten classroom. At Wexford, there was an author visit to kick off the year. Last year, you know, visitors were kind of a, a difficult thing to do. We've found ways to do that, even if it includes virtual creative activities. Um, the kids were able to make some courage shields and connect um, back with uh, the author, Peter Reynolds, of I Am Courage uh, and create courage shields. We had students in PRVA learning different concepts related to social studies um, in creative new ways. Again, they were able to collaborate online, um, creating illustrations of different types of water features that were in Mesopotamian civilization. Uh, at Eden Hall, this is an example of some kiddos taking a mask break in that is a structured team building activity where they were also playing rock, paper, scissors together as a class. At the middle school, we were really excited to unveil the new look of the library and all the flexible furniture that we have. Uh, the students are enjoying that, and quite literally, you can see the blur in the picture from the flurry of activity um, as they were running through um, the new created space. And at the high school, we're really trying to think through, in all of our buildings, but this is one example at the high school, of how to use the space that we have to spread students out to allow team building and other opportunities to exist the way that it had previously. So that was a quick version of some of the highlights. Um, while the rest of our time was focused on um, speaking about the continuum um, that we have in place for education, the number of kids in um, PRVA at present, um, the fact that we are keeping very accurate seating charts, we're introducing tables back in the kindergarten classroom and other spaces with plexiglass um, involved so that the students are still um, feeling together, although they are safely doing so. And um, one of the most important items that we discussed was that for students who are placed within to the quarantine or isolation period, so whether it is a, a COVID-related um, instance that is something our nurses have vetted, have looked into the details of, uh, it's something that we've um, discussed and we're following the guidelines from the Allegheny County Health Department in terms of their flowchart for identifying close contacts, et cetera, we are able to keep continuity of learning for those students at this point. Um, an email was sent out to our families on Friday um, discussing this in a little bit greater detail, but for students in grades three through 12, they will have the opportunity to log in and passively um, take part in class, be able to hear and see everything that's happening within the classroom through either a Google Meet link or Blackboard Collaborate. Um, as a teacher will be speaking, they'll be able to hear that, the class interacting, they'll be able to hear that, and they'll be able to see anything that is displayed on the interactive display board um, within the classroom setting. In grades K to two, we're leaving that to teachers and families to discuss what is the most developmentally appropriate way to approach that accessing, uh, access of the learning so that the students um, can either join um, and be passively taking part in class or um, completing those activities asynchronously. So we're excited to have this um, put into place and um, to help our students keep up with their learning throughout. Yeah. Later in the agenda, there's an action item, the MOU for board consideration. It was uh, supported by uh, the Pine Richland Education Association in their vote last week. And we appreciate the ability as an organization to work collaboratively with our staff to serve our students through our mission. And so we have Mr. Vins here tonight. He is the president of the PREA. Uh, but again, we appreciate the opportunity uh, to work collaboratively. And things will continue to evolve, I'm sure. We don't know exactly how, 
but we have set ourselves up to have 99.8 or 5 percent of our students in person and our goal now is to keep them in person and to follow the mitigation that is um, outlined. Uh, Dr. Justice, by design, but it's okay, you don't have to go back. On Fridays, for right now, Fridays at noon, we will update the COVID tracker that is on the website. So that includes active cases. It's broken out by building as well. Active cases means a case of either a student or staff member that's within the 10 days of when they became in, uh, symptomatic or had a positive test result. And then we'll also keep track there of students or staff who are in quarantine based upon a school-based positive case. So we know that quarantine can happen perhaps because of a community exposure. So for example, there might be a karate class or something happening and someone in that karate class was positive and therefore there are close contacts there. Uh, all of those, regardless of where they originate, will work through our school nurses, which is through our health office, which then allows us to ensure that we're working with Allegheny County in terms of the decision making, and then we'll support them through what's on this slide. So uh, again, just some additional detail. Thank you. And this model was the topic of our joint governance meeting uh, where we spoke uh, at, at length uh, and reviewed some of the details of the quarantine and some of the details of return to school and how our model's working. So thank you. Any other questions or comments from the board? Item 3.01 is a consent agenda, a motion to approve items 3.02 through 3.10 as attached. Second. Second. Is there any discussion? possibly two things uh, and we're like I said really excited about this uh, it is a, um, a, a team sport and it's unified between um, students with special needs and students without and uh, it's it's different than what we have typically done in the past with our, like our best friends program which acts as kind of mentorship this is more of a, an equal stance of all members of the team working together uh, for you know, the common goal of competition and, and, and having fun there will be four um, matches. Um, I think one will, have, will, will occur here. Uh, there will also be regional playoffs and then also state playoffs. Um, and like I said, it will be treated like a varsity sport for, for all students involved. And we will be joining some other schools such as Shaler, Moon, Fox Chapel, Deer Lakes, Mount Lebanon, Avonworth, Arlington, Hampton, and the list goes on. So we're really excited about this and uh, we're looking to have in the ballpark of six to 16 students participate this year. Fantastic. So are those games hey, Peter. Here? that they'll be done? Are these like, is it a tournament that will occur or are they different? They'll be a, a winter sport. Okay. Uh, okay. We'll start uh, at, the, at the end of November. November. Thank you. Um, and like I said, I think it's two practices a week and okay. um, four matches between, sing, single matches uh, between us and other schools. And then following those four matches, there, there will be regional playoffs and then a state tournament. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion or comments regarding the consent agenda? All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Mr. Kashani, can you walk through finance? I sure can. Item 4.01 is a motion to approve the financial reports dated July 31st, 2021, Fund 10 General Fund unaudited, dated June 30th. 2021 and to approve the accounts payable dated September 13th, 
2021 in the amount of $18,822.72 and paid accounts for August, September in the amount of $6,557,223.66 as listed. Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item 4.02 is a motion to approve the following individuals as check signers for the accounts listed. Pine Richen High School Athletics, Dr. Nancy Bauman, Principal, Dr. Frank Hernandez, Assistant Principal, Dr. Stephanie Spillar, Assistant Principal, Ms. Gina Mahowski, Assistant Principal. Pine Richland High School Activities, Dr. Nancy Bauman, Principal, Dr. Frank Hernandez, Assistant Principal, Dr. Stephanie Svillar, Assistant Principal, Ms. Gina Mahowski, Assistant Principal. Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item 4.03 is information only that there will not be any budget transfers until October. And item 4.04 .04 is also information that our next finance governance meeting is scheduled for December 13th at 6. Thank you, Mark. My pleasure. Mr. DiTulio, do you want to walk through buildings and grounds? Yes, item 5.01 <clears throat> is an action item. It's a motion to approve the attached contract for professional services from Tower Engineering for rooftop unit replacement at Wexford, Hance, and Richmond Elementary and in the amount of 56200 Second. Is there any discussion? Yes, I want to let you know I'll be abstaining from voting on this because my husband is an employee of Mitsubishi um, electric company and he is uh and and the rooftop units that are quoted in here as uh under consideration are mitsubishi split units so there is a form you could follow i did that as I, williams yes and uh, could i have dr mihalik if you'd be nice enough to second that motion then I, oh, i'm sorry okay yeah. Yeah. i'll be happy to second it thanks thank you i don't know but yeah that's why not <laughs> motion's been made and seconded is there any discussion all those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? Yes. And one abstention from Ms. Mismek. Motion carries. Item 5.02 is a motion to approve settlement of disputed charges uh, from a change order claim with TPK Inc on the Ram Cage field number six, pro six project in the amount of $65,000. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item 5.03 is a motion, uh, action item, a motion to approve repair by Cameron property solutions LLC of the middle school cafeteria walk-in freezer by replacing the condensing unit at a cost of $11,800. Second. Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? <laughs> Motion carries. And item 5.04 is an information and uh, project on the summer project uh, update. Uh, Mr. Zimmerman, I believe this, uh, this goes to you. Actually, I'm going to take it this evening. Um, oh. So uh, Mr. Zimmerman was not able to join us this evening. However, he and I met today and we kind of we went over this list. Um, he did want me to share that the items listed in yellow will be accomplished during the school year. So we are mapping out um, timelines for each of the yellow items listed. For the blue item listed, which is the middle school gym door replacement, um, those have been on order. We did um, purchase those and that was board approved a while back. Um, he said he was very happy that we placed the order when we did because in speaking with the vendor, 
Currently, the doors are on back order, but they're coming. Um, but the price of them has gone up 22% since we ordered them. So um, that is a positive for us that we uh, got them in whenever we did. And then um, as we work with Tower Engineering moving forward for the HVAC unit replacements that we will be um, proposing to use the ARP ESSER money um, for, we will provide um, additional detail at that time. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Dr. Meyer, academic achievement. Item 6.01 is, just give me a second for it to load, um, a motion to approve the memora memorandum of understanding between Pine Richland School District and the PREA as presented. Second. Is there any discussion? Just want to thank the teachers and the, the PREA for mm -hmm. approving this, for collaborating with the, with the district and with the board to make this happen for our students, for their learning. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank, thank you, Mr. Vins. I know this, this takes a lot of time. Sometimes people wonder what goes on at a school over the summer. You're a teacher. I think you were working this summer uh, quite a lot on this and other items. I know we mentioned this MOU as a topic of executive session back in July. Uh, so it takes some time to work through these details. We're very happy with the results, and we're very happy uh, with our teachers. Thank you. And uh, this is Greg. I, I will vote for this um, because we need to do something. I, I feel that this does not go far enough. I wish we would have gone further. We as a school and as a society are asking parents um, to keep their kids home for more reasons than they normally would. Um, so if you keep a child home that is not officially quarantined, they don't qualify for this. I, um, I disagree with that. I think this should go further, uh, but we have to move forward in some way, so I will vote for it, but it could have and should have gone much further. Thank you, Greg. Any other comments? Um, I just also want to thank um, the teachers. Um, full disclosure, I work in the field, and I know how tired educators are, and um, it's a lot of work, and we appreciate what you do. Thank you. All those in favor? Say yes. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. Item 6.02 is Smart Futures Career and Education Work Standards Tool. And I'm going to guess I'm going to pass this off to Dr. Pasquinell. No, Dr. Justin. Dr. Okay. Justin. <laughs> uh, so we have been working um, to identify a solution. We've been working to identify a solution for our um, career, education, and work standards evidence uh, to be collected and consolidated into one place. Uh, the K3 level, they've been utilizing paper folders in a file cabinet. And at the 4 6 level, they have been utilizing Google Docs. And so when we go to audit things or run reports, um, it, it is us plugging things into an Excel spreadsheet and then identifying what that is. So we know there are better ways of doing this. Um, we did identify through a process um, with uh, an out the outside vendor, the smart um, futures individuals that this is something that would be a potential resource for us. The counselors are in the process of piloting that. Um, it would help us unify things K-6. Uh, it does have additional um, benefits in terms of providing activities that match with the career education work standards. So we'll have more information for you. It's just to let you know that this is a solution we're looking into um, that we believe has some utility for us at that level. And just one piece for secondary. So secondary has been using Naviance. Hopefully families are aware of that resource. And that's where the students' um, evidence is archived right now. So it's meant to be a portfolio, Smart Futures K to 6, Navi on 7 to 12. We may look at modifying that, but right now that provides a nice portfolio of students for the full K to 12 experience. From a broader perspective, this is an example of what are hundreds of requirements, regulations that exist for schools that most people never even think about. And so how to manage that, where to fit that, how to make that meaningful for students, how to track it and report it. It's just, I think most people don't ever, something like this would never cross their mind. Ultimately, I'd, I'd say the, the impact, potential impact on students and families is tremendous. You know, to have a nice portfolio of yourself mm -hmm. to help you figure out what's next after high school, to save you time and money, 
uh, is really valuable. So we have worked to improve those learning experiences every year. We're going to continue to do that. We're really excited about Smart Futures mm -hmm. and what that will bring our students to. Okay, thank you. Anything else? If not, item 6.03 is a reminder of the Academic Achievement Government Meeting scheduled for November 18th, 2021. The 2021 Academic Achievement and Growth Report will be presented. This is an off-night meeting and no bo uh, board planning or meeting, break room meeting will follow. Thank you, that's everything. And we're gonna go late, bring your own snacks, <laughs> settle in. Maybe we can put on coffee depending on COVID. Mrs. Swope, Student Services. Item 7.01, it's a information item um, for board consideration at the October planning meeting. Motion to approve the 2022 Spring Music Department trip. Um, student attendance for the school band, high school, school, high school band, choir, and an orchestra to travel to Orlando uh, in April and there is no cost to the district. Is there any discussion? Just to say, those are always, you know, uh, it's a hope. Um, again, we'll see where we are. We have language in there. We've been working with travel agencies to make sure we have contingency planning with that. So that is a goal. We hope to have that opportunity. You can see the learning experiences listed there for the students. So we're excited about it. It's, it's always a wonderful experience but we got to keep an eye on cases, conditions. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tasha. Dr. Mihalik, Staff Services. Thank you. Item 8.01 is a motion to approve the personnel supplemental and transportation items as attached. Second. Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Can I just make a brief announcement? So um, you do hear a lot in the news about school bus driver shortages. Uh, we have been in a really good position. Uh, STA, we have a target for the number of routes and drivers needed, plus uh, a bench, if you will, extra substitute drivers available to cover routes. And they have continued to meet that target for workforce, which is very positive. There are two areas that we really continue to see need. Uh, one, Sodexo, which is our food service key partner uh, in the food service injury, uh, industry. People are struggling to, to find staff. And so there are opportunities for, for people in our community or outside our community if they're looking for work through food service, so I'll do a bit of a commercial for uh, Sodexo and Mrs. Bucknam. Uh, at Pine Richland, we also look for certain positions. Custodian is an example of the positions that schools and our school district are looking for. Um, sometimes the wages on an hourly rate might not be something similar to what a person could find outside, but there are significant uh, health benefits and other considerations for working in a school environment. And so uh, sometimes the best recruiting we can do is just to encourage through word of mouth people that we know who might be interested in, the, in a particular job. Uh, and so we would encourage people to pass that word along. Item 8.02, information item, tenure. Pine Richland School Board and administration recognize the tenure status of the following individuals. Jacqueline Cerny, Amanda Dempsey, Cindy Poole, Valerie Shockling, and Stephen Shade. Congratulations. Thank you, Dr. Mihalik. Thank you. <clears throat> Under board business, item 10.01 is discussion around the election of PSBA officers and PSBA insurance trustees in these elections, there is only one competitive uh, election, which is for the office of president-elect. Uh, I had communicated with the board uh, that I would like to nominate David Scott, who I serve with on the AIU board, uh, 
Amy, you served with the Brentwood Borough School District, and he is one of the candidates for president-elect. Mm -hmm. That's for voting in our October meeting. Any other comments or discussion on that item? Item 10.02 is a discussion information item around board goals and the strategic plan. As you all remember, we have our own section of the strategic plan and goals, annual goals with, within that. I wanted to highlight the 21-22 goals uh, and discuss them a little bit, fill them out a little bit, uh, because some of them uh, we can uh, get into a little more detail with. The first item, uh, in a general sense, we've had the goal of increasing and creating a more robust system of training and onboarding for board members uh, for over four years now. We had a big transition with five new board members at that time and knew how important it was uh, to bring those board members up to speed as quickly as possible, but also uh, in an appropriate manner. Subsequent to that, the legislature passed Act 55, and we were very proud to be one of the first school districts to be a Pennsylvania Department of Education approved training organization for the mandatory new board member and returning board member training. Ms. Williams, thank you, uh, which I know you were instrumental in that application and in keeping uh, that material and those training systems organized. Once again, we face a likelihood of board turnover in this election. <coughs> we have four open seats and only one incumbent uh, running for that. So we'll, we'll likely have at least three new faces joining us next year. We have the requirements under Act 55. Uh, but we also have the particular exigencies of the 21-22 school year. And we have to focus on those items as well, which will be of interest to anyone joining a school board right now. Uh, the administration is already working on refining those training materials uh, and working with board leadership in defining a onboarding schedule and training schedule. Everyone here has gone through some form of training uh, those who joined in the past four years went through a more robust format, um, but that we refine it based on feedback from all of you and uh, look forward to doing so again this year with that material. Any comments on the Act 55 and the new board member training? That's been very helpful. <laughs> And learning the uh, all the information and getting to know the the staff the the senior leadership team it's been you know what almost four years for me and um, I can remember coming on here and uh, it's um, there is there is a, a lot a lot to learn but it was really helpful uh, to to get to know the the senior leadership team um, to find out the background what they do really to see the cohesiveness of that team and then to also work with the other board members too and getting to know them. So, and there was, there was a lot, I mean, it wasn't just one time, it was many different mm -hmm. meetings and workshops and so on that we did, but it was very, very helpful. So, and along with the PSBA, the information that they have online, the, the um, uh, classes and so on, that, or courses that you can take uh, as well and any other, you know, uh, education that you want to do past that, so. Uh, second item, board self-evaluation and focus goal setting. I'll, I'll really just sort of say that's, that is sort of what we're doing here and what we've done uh, in providing that information back to the board and reflecting. Some of that happened, of course, in May and June. Board policy review. 800s, 900s, and 100s. Uh, that's no, <coughs> there's no small potatoes there. That's, I can see Barb shaking. <laughs> so <laughs> it's operations. It's community and programs. So there's some heavy lifting there. We were on a call with the Mid-Atlantic Alliance for Performance Excellence mm -hmm. today. And I, I can tell you, it was with little doubt in our minds that Dr. Miller could say that we know of no other district organization that regularly undergoes their policy reviews to ensure they're timely, up to date, and that there is understanding of them in the board and throughout the organization like we do. It's it's a slog sometimes, 
Uh, but that is our primary purpose is to set policy. So we will continue with that again this year. If I could just add briefly, the, the good news, uh, while there are many policies for review, because this is now our second time through the cycle, uh, most of the significant changes that happened in policy happened in that last batch. So hopefully, you know, barring legislative changes, we have these are a review, fine tuning in some cases, or in, in certain small number of cases, there might be new regulations or legislation. So that's the benefit, the hard work. The, the most significant hard work was done in that first cycle through the entire board book. And again, for those who don't know, we have 249 to 250 policies across the entire board book. Third item is school visitations, in this case highlighting the PR Virtual Academy Plus and in-depth program reform implementations. I don't know if you have uh, some more details to fill in there, Dr. Miller. Well, our, th our thought process is we'll refine the focus, but one of the best parts of school visitation has been to be able to see in action in the schools the things that are talked about here through joint governance and some of the strategic work. So we'll plan the same thing and we'll plan part of that to be physical and part of that to be a virtual drop into the PRVA to see that uh, program in action as well. Uh, at this point, our thought process with the transition back to school is that we'll focus on school visitations here in the fall preparing the onboarding plan and training, but my recommendation would be we wait until mid-year uh, and into the spring to get into our batch policy review, just in terms of pacing the work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I, I'd like to, to go off of that and talk about the next two items, key community partnerships <coughs> and integrated communications, with the suggestion that we follow that visit uh, with an e-blast to the community. Um, with some pictures and talking about what we saw, what we observed, uh, the evidence that we collected for the work that's going on in the classrooms, the implementation of our, of our programs. We've done different messages. We have some things that we've developed to be habit, uh, which is a finance message in the spring. Uh, but I think in talking, Christine and I were speaking this weekend about what a targeted message might look like from the board this year. And I think highlighting that school visit uh, would seem like a good idea for this fall, but open for suggestion and discussion. I, part of our conversation uh, was that I always felt that when I left the, the school visitation, I always felt it would be so nice if, you know, if the community could come in and see this, which would not be possibly very disruptive, but <laughs> it, it is just so <laughs> valuable to see that. And then in our conversations today with the, um, the Mid-Atlantic Alliance Performance Examiners, um, they, I, I mentioned about the, um, the school visitations as a way for us to see some of the processes that we um, hear about, uh, like the mi um, middle tier, multi-tier multi -tier system, system, system of support, and how we were able to do that at Hanson Elementary in action with the teachers, uh, going through something that they would have with a student, no student present, but that to kind of share how that process went, and it kind of brings it to life, and it, it uh, has a lot more meaning um, when, I'm, when we hear about it, when we're evaluating that, uh, supporting it. So it's uh, quite valuable. I think it, it also reinforces the work of, of all of us who are here because the, the, the systems that get designed, that get refined, that get put into place, the interactions that occur, the, the plot leadership, how it filters through professional development and becomes embodied in the way the systems function, being able to experience that is invaluable as a board member. Now, I belong to other organizations uh, and have through the years that don't have that degree of integration, that degree of thoughtful planning where you don't see the evidence of what's happening at the policy design level and oversee oversight level <coughs> and how things function every day. So it's really, that's been a very much a, a, um, a very meaningful experience for me over the years when we've done that. And I look forward to what we have um, coming down this year. Hopefully, um, as things are returning to somewhat more normal, um, 
we can expand some of the things that we, we expect to see about what that transition you know, to a more normal environment looks like. Yeah, I, I also want to comment on the visitations. For me, this is like one of the most rewarding areas of being actually a school board member because you see the students, you get to observe the lessons and um, those policies, they come alive because we are a little bit above the, the ground <laughs> when we make our decisions, but those decisions, they trickle down and they impact the students. And it's, it's a great learning experience for me, for example, too, because my kids are younger so like learning about the, the next steps, it was very meaningful and very, very important. So I, I, I'm looking forward to like visitations in person again. Absolutely, yeah. Any other comments or discussion around the 21-22 board goals? Item 10.03 is also a discussion information item uh, for board consideration in, in the October planning meeting. There will be a motion to approve the first reading of board policy 006 meetings and 903 public participation in board meetings as attached. Uh, these are revisions uh, required by the passage of Act 65 of 2021. We've mentioned it in passing here uh, we've been in compliance with that and we already are operating in compliance with it. We're bringing these policies up to speed with the PSBA recommended language uh, enshrining our current practice. Mm -hmm. I just have one minor comment on that in looking through the red line version of it under the notes section at the end of um, policy um, 006. Uh, zero, 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 that there's some language there that looks like it's editorial in nature that probably was just kind of left over. Yeah. That'll be removed when okay. it's sent to PSBA to check all the references and sites and things. So. Got it. Okay. Thanks. If I had a question in there as far as uh, there was um, a part in there that um, if we introduce if there's a new item that is introduced by the uh, you know the public and we introduce it onto the agenda itself and then we have in there that there is to be a uh, when an item is added to the agenda after the public comment period is ended the board shall offer further public comment opportunity limited to the added item that that's wording that was added in there do we need that in there because we already have a we already have an, uh, a public recognition at the end or is that an, an additional one prior to if it's something that we are then We should do it before we on. vote. Okay. And, and, and in fact, many bodies that. have done that um, okay. just by custom for some time now. If there's, if a new item comes up, you right. know. Okay, just wanted to clarify. Yeah. All right, thank Yeah, you. that's specifically in the Act 65 okay. where if there's something added new, you have to allow somebody to speak to it. Okay. Uh, a community mm -hmm. member. The, 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 the one question I did have, um, and again, this is new, and so these things are, are often uh, figured out, well, Don, as they, as they go along, right? So, and I'm in policy, uh, <clears throat> I guess this is um, 006. The policy cites uh, reasons, the board may deliberate or take official action on matters not on the agenda in the following circumstances. What's not clear to me is whether if you're under one of those reasons, which would be emergencies, business arising within 24 hours prior to the meeting or uh, de minimis business raised by residents or taxpayers, is it required to then take also that majority vote? Or do those three, three reasons seem to say, well, if it's one of those three, you don't need to take a vote on adding it to the agenda. I, I, it wasn't clear to me. I'll look at that closer and give you an opinion on that. Clearly, if you're adding something that doesn't fall within one of those categories, uh, the board does have to take action at the meeting, announcing the reason for adding it and taking a vote on whether or not to add it to the agenda. And then if it's added, 
um, it can be voted on and the minutes have to be posted showing that something was added to the agenda. And I will take a look at Act 65 to answer your specific question of whether that process has to be gone through with regard to those specific items. I guess I would just say just, just vote on it anyway, right? That's the easier thing to do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, fair enough. <coughs> Um, under the regular meetings, it says regular board meetings shall be open uh, and shall be held, held at a specific place at least once every two months. With the virtual options now, saying a specific place, is it home base has to be DeWitt or how is, I guess, what's, what's the specific place? Because with a virtual option, I mean, virtually we could be you know, in six different continents. So um, is is that wording needed to be left in there like that? I mean, just saying that the public board meeting shall be open and held at least once every two months, is that, um, is that suffice? I, I So I'll say this, uh, Greg, as I understand it, <clears throat> We're, it's not clear, although we've made revisions to our policy, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, Greg, we made revisions to our policy that don't bind um, the board to have majority in-person attendance. This language, I don't believe, is new. Um, this language was pre-existing, and it's not clear that the requirement to have a physical nexus for the meeting doesn't still exist. Well, in other words, it probably does. Um, now, that doesn't mean that any of us need to be there. That physical nexus could be Ms. Williams with a laptop in this room. But it's not clear that we really haven't divorced ourselves from that nexus entirely. When we did so, over the past 18 months, uh, we were doing so also under the umbrage of emergency orders. So I think that that's why that language persists. Yeah, I understand what you're saying, but if, you know, without questioning some of these things that that come up, like, you know, how long do we um, advertise in papers and no one reads papers anymore, you know? So those are the kind of things that I think we should question. I, I personally would like to take that out of there because if for whatever reason we can't be there, there's a flood, there's a storm, whatever, um, and Barb happens to be at home and it's supposed to be at DeWitt, you know, does that put us on con in conflict? Um, that's all I'm saying. I, I, I personally would like that language removed if, if at all legal and possible. Greg, that, la that language that you're referring to is in the school code, um, placed in there probably in 1949 when the school code was adopted. So I don't think we should remove it. Um, we, we certainly meet the timeliness of meetings. We have multiple meetings every month, so that's not an issue. Just identifying the location. Um, as Mr. Lyons indicated, it's typically right here at DeWitt, which can be noticed. If we do have an unusual situation where nobody can be here, um, the advertisement can reference the um, live streaming link and I, I suspect somebody's still gonna be here operating. So we can take care of that and address the location. But I'd say my recommendation would be to leave that language in there because that is right out of the school code. Any other discussion on these two policies? I did want to, before we go on to right to know, I did want to talk about those policies a little bit and um, a little bit about Mr. Corey's comments and a little bit about the board goals. So the last item there, key community partnerships, systematic and integrated communication, and reflecting on the board self-evaluation and the parent and staff evaluation, one area that comes up in a lot of discussions is transparency. And there's a lot of misunderstanding about what we have to do, what we should do, what is done in education generally. Um, 
there are a number of examples of transparency of this district, especially around our agendas, the information that we provide, uh, the detailed attachments, the explanations, that goes largely unnoticed. <coughs> there are other areas where we do more, much, much more than other surrounding districts in the area of personnel and contracts that still seems to be a source of confusion or criticism. One of the suggestions in trying to address those concerns was to develop a form of transparency index <coughs> for the district with comparators uh, because I think that's one of the most difficult things about when you become a school board member is it, it's different. If you have experience as a banker, a doctor, um, even a university professor, what you experience as a school board member can be very different. Understanding that context and understanding what we do and understanding the level of transparency that we provide in that context <coughs> of public education I think is very important. And I'd like to bring a lot of that information together uh, that we've mentioned uh, throughout the year, especially this year, uh, into a more sort of cohesive document <coughs> in one place as part of those communication efforts. The policy revisions are, are part of it as well, right? Uh, so I think it fits, I wanted to mention it in here as well because all that gets to, <coughs> gets to policy as well. I would suggest already, if you look in Western Pennsylvania, the level of detail that we are providing on our agenda items prior to our meetings far surpasses what you will be able to find elsewhere in Allegheny County. Far sur surpasses. It's, uh, I think sometimes people criticize for transparency and what they really mean is they just don't like a certain decision. And I think providing a reference tool uh, for what we do and how it's done uh, could be very useful. It's going to take some time to develop, of course, um, <clears throat> but I think it's a worthwhile effort. Mm -hmm. Mark, Greg, any comments or thoughts there? Okay. Item 10.04 is the discussion, informa discussion information item on right to know. I'll turn it over to Mr. Palmer to begin. Thank you, Mr. Lyons. In May, the district received a right to know request from William Wickard on behalf of an unnamed individual seeking a broad array of records from the district. In response to that request, the administration undertook a comprehensive review of records and provided a timely response to the requester, granting access to certain records and denying access to other records based on exemptions in the right to know law. Mr. Wickard filed an appeal of that denial to the Office of Open Records, and at the end of August, the Office of Open Records issued a decision upholding the district's denial of certain records and directing that certain other records be released. Uh, we have been reviewing that with the administration. The records, many of the records at issue involve email communications that parents provided to the district relating to sensitive information regarding their children. Um, that presents issues of concern, certainly to me. Um, I would expect that when parents sent those emails to the district, working with the district on issues involving their children, they never expected that someday they could be um, presented in the public for third parties to review and share with others. Um, the district has the right to appeal the decision of the Office for Open Records. 
While there's never a guarantee, we believe that there are solid grounds to do so under the right to know law. And that's something that we have been discussing uh, with administration over the past uh, couple of weeks. Thank you, Mr. Palmer. Could you give us like an example, Dr. Miller? I mean, what are we what are we talking about with this request? And I'll, I'll uh, you know, what what would be something that we would feel is t is too sensitive and maybe theoretical to keep that out? Yeah. So I, to generalize, what I would say is, right to know requests are a part of they they happen all the time. We have had more right to know requests in the last six months that we would have in a typical year, uh, but right to know requests are a part of what happens in in public education. The, and they can take many different forms. Sometimes right to know requests based on how they're constructed include what turn out to be a significant number of email messages that have to be reviewed to understand whether they're responsive and then again work through that process. And depending on the nature of the request involves different people who are part of the school district. I think what Mr. Palmer was saying uh, given this specific request is that when a parent makes a decision to communicate a concern to the school, most of the time when a parent is uh, thinking or worried about something or wants to share something or wants some action to take place, you know, they are thoughtful in, in considering that and they send that message to a teacher perhaps or they send it to a guidance counselor uh, or they might send it to a principal or assistant principal uh, this happens, this is a part of what happens all the time because email is the manner in which many people communicate today. So um, the, what Mr. Palmer is referring to is that if an email between a parent, let's say, and a teacher or a parent and a counselor, when that email was written by the parent, the parent never for one moment likely thought that that could be, even if redacted with the student name, but keeping all other information in it, would never dream that that information would be released by the school district to a third party or posted on the internet or something like that. And depending on the nature of the email, parents communicate in a, in a genuine way to staff members. And even with some redaction, there can be, depending on the situation, some specific you know, you might know the building, you're going to know the level, you're going to know um, specific things around a child, and depending on the nature of those comments, it can be very, uh, it can reach a point of personal identifiable information, even if the name itself is redacted. And so, again, the concern, uh, it, it isn't about, again, we respond to right to know requests all the time. And, um, Sometimes it's, it's responding in part, sometimes it's responding in whole, sometimes it's requesting extensions, sometimes it's delivering it within five days. Uh, they vary case by case. But in this case, the concern is specific sensitive information written from a parent to a teacher or counselor or principal and, um, and whether that is a record that qualifies under right to know. May I? Please, Dr. Um, Mark. You know, working with children and educators for a long time, I have some particular concerns about this. Um, you know, when parents reach out, I had a friend, I'm not gonna, you know, had a friend reach out with something that a student had heard and she was afraid to reach out because she didn't want her child retaliated against. So when we allow emails that parents have written what they believe is confidential to a counselor or to a teacher that gives detailed information about what happened, whether it includes things as ethnicity, race, religion, or identity as an LGBTQIA student. Folks, we're not that diverse. So that information gets out into the public. That student, whether they intended to do it or not, is now gonna be identified. Think about that. A kid who is reaching out for help, who's being bullied or harassed, 
tells the parent, and then the parent reaches out confidentially. And now that email is open to the public. We just betrayed the parent's trust and the child's trust. That will have a chilling effect of parents being willing to reach out and children being willing to say anything. Children have a hard enough time now reporting bullying and, and hazing and any of those things. So making it open to the public is going to hurt relationships between teachers, children, and parents and counselors. That's my thought. I have a question. Um, legally, let's say I was one of these parents that sent an email and now I hear about this and I'm concerned. Is there anything I could do to prevent my particular situation from being released in a right to know? Is there any way to stop that if it's deemed public? Yeah, that's an interesting question because the parties are the requester and the school district. Uh, there are vehicles by which the person who created the record, the email, could um, take action to join in a um, review of the matter, whether that's before the Office for Open Records, likely not there because that happened so fast, or in a court proceeding. So but even at that point, I'm still putting myself in the public saying there's something I don't want to disclose. Correct. So that could equally impact my child. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Mihalik. Yeah, I guess what I want to say here is that the reluctance that's being expressed here on the board um, comes from out of a concern for parents, students, the quality of communication back and forth and trust in the district. Um, what's happening here is a, a third party in an outside process is starting to um, drive things in a direction um, that, that, that are forcing the hand, potentially, of the district. You know, the, the, we've talked about appeal. Um, one of the reasons for doing an appeal is for this sort of protection. Um, it's for the idea of making sure that we are not just releasing all sorts of things that can have high consequences like this. So I think this is something that needs to be weighed very carefully. Um, and I think everyone here is doing that. You know, any attempt to take what the responsibility that this body bears um, and the administration <coughs> bears, um, as if somehow this is a reluctance to comply or engaging in behavior that hides things. That's not what any of this is about at all. Um, this is about being responsible with information that's sensitive and really speaks to the heart of the matter of trust in our community. Agreed. I would go further. And I'd say any suggestion that these requests represent attempts at transparency is false. It's not a third party. It's Mr. John Corey. He did so, in his words, in the same breath that he formed a committee to run for school board. These are abusive fishing expeditions. He seems to believe governing is a game of gotcha after he lost his football coach. Let me give you an example. And no personal attacks in this meeting. Why are you doing this? I'm just personal, calling out. No personal attacks. Let me give you an example. And this is one of multiple bullet points. This is just one. And if you're at home listening, you can raise your hand privately in your own home if this request applies to you. Any and all emails from personal work accounts or text messages sent to or from any current or former Pine Richmond School District employee or current or former school district school board member. So a text message to a teacher that was regarding any instance of hazing, bullying, or cyberbullying for the period September 2016 to present. 
So if you're an eighth grader, in third grade you sent a text message to a teacher about an issue that you thought might have been bullying on the bus, that's being requested. That serves the public good. Let's be clear, it's not a hypothetical that that's going to get posted on the internet. Mr. John Corey told us tonight he's going to post it on the internet. His words. That, by the way, is one of over a dozen requests. That's just one. Do I think that's abusive? Yeah. Will we comply with the law as appropriate? Yes. Have we answered normal, appropriate requests, like the legal fees? Yes, and we do so all the time. Will we appeal this? Yes, we will. And I think any parent who values confidentiality in their communications with the district about their students will support and understand that as well. I'd also like to make the point that when, uh, Peter, when you mentioned that, you know, the over dozen requests, that that's a lot of material between text messages and emails for the uh, administration to cover. And when Mr. Corey did mention about the, um, the cost, there's not only cost legally for review, there's also the cost of uh, the district individuals, their time and the distraction away from education that that takes as well. So that's, that's something to be considered and that's being brought upon the district. That, that cost is being laid on the district through a community member costing the rest of the community members to absorb that cost as well. And that concerns me. That's not governance. That's not governance. Mm -hmm. Not sticking around to even hear this discussion from him or the candidates. That's not governance. That's throwing hand grenades. And it's distraction to this institution, and it negatively impacts our students and families. It's deeply concerning. While I 100% agree that we should appeal this, because we should for the, the reasons noted, I mean, there are some very personal emails that were written by concerned parents about their children. Those things absolutely should be protected. So we should absolutely appeal this. But at the same time, as a board, we may think we know the reasons why somebody's making a request, but it is the public's ability to make these requests. We're going through the process. Um, what we have to do is follow that process. But to, unless they specifically say, and, and Peter, you made a comment that because he, an individual lost his football coach, that's why he's doing this. You don't know that. He did not say that. Mr. Detulio, he, he said it right here, speaking he to the entire board, that if you appeal, we're going to fight it, we're going to get it, and we're going to put it out there for everyone to see. I could go back right. and look at his exact words. But mark my words, Mr. Corey uh, he, was explicit. He, he did say that he would post it, but he did not say, because specifically my coach was fired or a coach was fired, this is why. And yeah, I he said he would that, post it, though, Greg, to be clear. Yes, he did. He did say that. But yeah. what I'm saying is let's not put uh, people's reasons, let's not make assumptions as to why somebody's doing something. The, the individual, and Mr. Corey identified himself, he is – 100% within his rights to make a request. We are 100% within our rights to appeal that request, right? At the end of the day, the Office of Open Records is going to make a determination. We will comply. And I think that's the message. We will comply, period. And we are letting people know, which isn't typical, we are letting people know the reasons why we are appealing this and they are absolutely sound fundamental reasons and we should do that and that's where we should stick 
it, you know, we talk about governance. Let's let's stick with the governance. The governance is we're going to follow the law, and this is part of that process. This is part of those laws, and that's where I think we should stick. That's all I'm saying about that. My concern was let's not get into innuendo and in anything else. Stick to the facts. The facts are there are very sensitive records that are being requested. As a board, as an administration, we are 100% within our rights, and we should appeal it. Uh, because I do think having some of those records out there is absolutely 100%. Um, uh, it, it really is going to shake trust between parents and administrators, parents and teachers. And, and the, reper the, the repercussions of that could be massive because people either won't reach out and or teachers won't respond the way that they want to and or administrators or counselors. All those things are valid points. And that's where we should stick. That's why we're going to appeal it. I hope the Office of Public Records absolutely uh, agrees with us because to put those out, I think is absolutely uh, dangerous and I, and I don't agree with putting those records out. But if the law tells us we have to, that's what we're gonna have to do. I agree with you, Greg. The one thing that, that I, I don't agree with was the assertion that Mr. Corey made that the district is is causing this expense and that's not true and i 100 agree with you there okay. i mean that's we the reasons it, it I, I agree with that we can simply say hey the district's not responsible for these expenses we have to be good stewards of this information we have to it is absolutely our obligation therefore it's a defensible expense correct okay yeah. But to get into anything else is just, I mean, if the public wants to get in and attack us, that's fine. We're the governance, right? I'm, I'm not going to try to go back and, and attack anyone in public, particularly at a public meeting. I'm just simply going to say, here's the reasons. They are sound reasons. If anyone disagrees with that, well, we're going to disagree. Office of Open Records is going to make that determination. And you I know? just want to reiterate, too, like, the concern is the students, parents reaching out with confidential information, expecting it to remain confidential. And there can be identifying information in there, even with names redacted. And if that good information gets out, students and parents may be harmed. And that worries me, and it worries me for our vulnerable students. Right, because the only thing that was uh, requested to be redacted was name, address, or date of birth, that's it. And that's not enough. I, I would actually like to make a recommendation that uh, in compliance uh, with our current practice regarding meetings and agenda, uh, we had a right to know law discussion item on the agenda, uh, but the board is giving some specific directions pursuant to a executive session uh, that we held. I'd like to actually make this a formal vote on filing this appeal. Uh, in order to make it a formal vote, I first uh, would like to make a motion or would entertain a motion from the floor, I should say, uh, to add a vote to our agenda. To be clear, item 10.04 was not a voting item in the agenda that was posted publicly. I'm suggesting that we add a voting item on this appeal in the interest of transparency. We've spoken a given direction, but I'm asking it to be more formal. For that vote to take place, the item needs to be placed on our agenda, and we first need to vote on placing it on our agenda. And I will entertain a motion to that end at this time. Second. I'll make a motion. Ms. Hayden. Do you, have, do you have suggested language uh, for Ms. Williams, possibly? Yeah, I, I, the motion was the motion was to add an item to the agenda to move to file an appeal with the uh, court regarding the decision of the Office of Open Records in the right to know matter filed by Mr. Wickard. 
that we yeah. had um, discussed here this evening. You can get that docket actually uh, from the um, executive content at the call to order, Ms. Williams. Mm -hmm. The docket number of the open records decision was AP 2021-1330. So AP 2021-1330. 2021-1330. And so the vote would be whether we add that to the agenda. Correct. That will be our first vote. We're ready. Can we yes. proceed? Yes. So the motion to add this item to our agenda has been made and seconded. Is there any discussion about adding it to our agenda? If this motion passes, we will then vote on the actual item, which is to file an appeal to the Office of Open Records case as identified. Any discussion around adding it to the agenda? All those in favor, say yes. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. Well, now that it's on the agenda, I can make, I feel comfortable making that motion. Yeah. I'm refreshing. I don't have it. You won't see it, so I can repeat it okay. for you. Motion to file an appeal with the court regarding the decision of the office. Oh, sorry. Let me start again. Motion to file an appeal with the court regarding the decision of the o Office of Open Records, number docket number AP 2021-1330 in the right to know filed by Mr. Wickard we discussed this evening. Can I have a second? Second. I have to interrupt the board, the meetings I've had to conduct board meetings. They, when we had an agenda in a board meeting, you have to allow for public comment. Thank you, Mr. Rexford. You're absolutely correct. Would anyone like to comment on this motion at this time? I'd like to comment. Sure. Same policies apply, Mr. Baxter. Three minutes. Sure. Thank you. Tom Baxter, Gibsonia, PA. The only thing I want to comment on is the conduct of this board, and specifically Mr. Lyons. Your conduct is completely unprofessional and disgraceful. You've personally called out a member of this community who is simply following the law and has acted within the, of the law. And uh, I don't know why you have rules that say that anybody in here that talks can't address anyone personally. You just personally threw someone under the bus without him here, which is very cowardly. And um, that's all I want to say is that if that's how you, you talk about how to conduct board business. That's not how to conduct board business, what you just did, okay? You want to talk about policy and about the law and about how you're not happy with it? That's fine. You don't personally call out someone, especially when they're not here. Thank you. Bye-bye. Any other comments? Mr. Bono. Hi, Chris Bono, uh, 2111 West Grove Drive in Gibsonia. Um, I want to encourage the board to file this appeal. Um, in my day job, I work with complaints that students file of sensitive nature that um, are given to me uh, as a mandatory reporter. And I also see appeals um, as part of a university review board. Um, these are very sensitive topics about events that change people's lives and the risk of re-traumatizing students um, is very real. And so um, I wanna thank you for um, taking this matter very seriously. Thank you, Mr. Bonner. Any other comments? Seeing how there is none, we have a motion and a second. Is I did. Oh, Christine, sorry, Christine did. We can proceed with board discussion. If there is any additional discussion at this time on the motion to file an appeal. Mm -mm. 
I just think we all should take a moment to reflect on community trust, people acting with intentions of protecting students, um, and, and um, recognizing the way governance is supposed to be structured, where there's an administration who's reliable, that executes on operational matters, governed by a board that sets policies and goals and a culture of the district, in dialogue with community, and it should be done in a way that helps support our district and our culture and our students. We can have some disagreements, but we can have discussions about those things. But we're now about to embark on something that a lot of people who never knew that they might be daylighted because they were reaching out for help may now be put at risk. And that has a big effect on the culture of our community. And we have to reflect on that very seriously. Thank you. Any other comments? Peter, this is Mark. It's important for us to do everything in our power within the law and within process to protect the confidentiality of our students and their parents and the staff at the school, especially whenever there's an attempt that's so broad reaching and is indeed a fishing expedition. Now, while we don't, and I agree with you, Greg, we, we shouldn't put words in anyone's mouth. However, I think it is fair to question motive of those that would do such a thing. When motive is rooted in anger, in bitterness, revenge, I think it's appropriate. We don't even have to do nothing more than to listen to the tone of voice, to the words that are used over and over and over again for months to know what motive is. And because of that type of motive, it's even especially important to do what we can to protect our students. Thank you, Mark. Any other comments? Can we have a roll call vote, Ms. Williams? Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Mihaly? Yes. Mr. DiTullio? Yes. Mr. Kashani? Yes. Mrs. Hayden? Yes. Mrs. Mizbach? Yes. Mrs. Swope? Yes. Dr. Meyer? Yes. Mr. Lyons? Yes. Motion passes. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, board members. Item 10.05 is just a review and reminder of joint governance meetings upcoming uh, in October, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and also October 18th, sustainability. Looking forward to that one. Um, November 15th, we review the model for teaching and learning. All meetings begin at 6 p.m. Uh, and are take place unless otherwise posted here in DeWitt. Eleven point oh one reports. Are there any reports from board members? The administration items that we didn't cover already. Just to echo, we're thankful the kids are back in school. So we've got a lot of things going on at all levels. We've had open house nights. We've had meet the teacher nights, curriculum nights. Activities are happening. Um, you know, one of the great parts about this campus in the district is what happens not just during the school day, but after. And you see that coming to life again with the number of activities and things that are happening. So again, we appreciate so much the support 
of everyone in the health and safety plan, even though we understand there are strong feelings that might not agree with certain things, what we're seeing is incredible cooperation and hopefully that will help keep kids and students engaged and involved and minimize the risk of anyone not being a part of it. So it's, it's great. We have homecoming coming up with weather permitting, uh, a dance activity happening out. You know, so there's, just, there's some good things happening that are more of a return to normalcy and hopefully we can keep that, keep that going. Thank you. Any other reports? Ms. Williams, do we have any virtual uh, speakers at the end of the meeting? We do not. We only have one in person, and it's Mr. Vince. Good evening. Uh, Chris Vince, uh, teacher at third grade Westford Elementary and also president of the Pine Ridge Education Association, or the PREA. Be brief but sincere. I want to thank the board for supporting this MOU. I'd also like to thank our PREA members and the district senior leadership team for their collaboration throughout this process. It was a lot of work to get us to this point, but we believe this MOU provides the best opportunity for quarantine students while also maintaining a strong focus for in-person students. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vince. Seeing I have no more speakers, uh, this meeting is adjourned. Have a good evening, everyone. <laughs>